Welcome, everybody, to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, and it's May 10th, 2023. And as always, I am joined by Arusha Pires, who is a portfolio manager over at O'Neill Global Advisors. How are you doing, Arusha? Doing well, Justin. Excellent. Uh, so we'll have some stuff to talk about today with the CPI. And who better to kind of chat about the markets than Kenny Polkari, uh, Kenny Polkari is back on the show with us. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have him talk about someone that brings passion to the job. Uh, of course, uh, Kenny is a chief market strategist right now over at Slatestone Wealth. Uh, he was a floor trader for O'Neill for a number of years, frequent CNBC contributor. Uh, the man has done it all. I mean, being on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange for decades kind of kind of lets you know a little bit about the ropes of how things work down there, huh? Yeah, yeah. Did you have to emphasize the word decades with an S? <laughs> right. I mean, well, I mean, listen, you might as well just said 40 years because that's what it was. But yes. So hey, I, I mean, if, if you start putting the numbers to how many decades it is, that's where it gets a little crazy. So, <laughs> yeah. well, you know what? It was a great, great experience. I wouldn't have changed any of that uh, in my life because it was such a phenomenal time to be, you know, not only in the markets, but kind of at what was the heartbeat of the capitalist system and the cap certainly in this country, um, the, the exciting times, and, you know, we can talk all about them from 1980 right up through, you know, current day, but yeah. it was a tremendous experience. And so, yes, thank you very much for that very kind intro. And yes, I did spend, uh, you know, five years at, uh, at O'Neill and I enjoyed my time there as well. Yeah, I was lucky enough to have uh, a couple tours from Kenny on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And of course, again, along with those a uh, few years of experience on the, on the floor. Uh, Kenny learned a lot about uh, what happens during crises. I mean, you started and it was a, a 19 blah, 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 crash. And uh, <laughs> then there was, you know, 2000, you know, 2001. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you've seen a lot happen on the floor of the exchange and yeah. know how to keep your cool through it. So we'll definitely cover a little bit of that, having the calm through the crisis, uh, but also we'll cover the current market and uh, go over a couple stocks. So how about it? Uh, where do you want to start, Kenny? I'm happy to do it. Well, why don't we talk about uh, the, the, you know, kind of the current environment, and then we mm -hmm. can, we can, because I think that makes the most sense, right? Where we now, are. You, you typically look at the S and P 500 to kind of get an overall. I mean, the Nasdaq has been leading, so yep. uh, which, Nasdaq, which one would you prefer to start with? Listen, the Nasdaq. We can start with the Nasdaq because look, the Nasdaq was the loser last year, and it's the leader this year, right? Mm -hmm. We saw right. we were down what 35 percent last year in the Nasdaq. We're up, you know, nearly 20%. Actually, I think if you look from the lows of December, we're actually in a new bull market in the NASDAQ, right? We were up 20% yesterday morning. So now, rah, rah, we're in a bull market for the NASDAQ. Year to date, we're up about 17%. That's great. Um, and so, you know, let's talk about that. So it's clearly resilient in the face of uh, rising interest rates, which is kind of interesting because... Uh, it shouldn't be as resilient as it is. But if you want my opinion, I think they, they punished it last year in front of what the conversation was. The Fed's going to raise. And so they smushed them last year. And now yeah. the Fed is actually doing what what they said they were going to do. And so we'd already taken the pain. And so now investors, I think, and certainly traders and algorithms are now kind of uh, reassessing. OK, we knew this was going to happen. We punished them all last year. They've all kind of downsized. They're all getting much more aware of costs and overhiring. And they've all made across the board um, uh, announcements to cut, lay off, pull back, cut expenses, blah, blah, blah. And so investors are loving that. And look where we are today, right? So I, I think it's very... I think it's very positive And I like that, especially because I own, you know, some tech names which are doing very well. Um, but I remain just a little bit skeptical because I don't think it's yet pricing in what I think is going to be a little bit of a tougher time as we move into the summer, right? I think they are yeah. going to finally come out and call it a recession. Uh, and I think it's going to be, I don't think you can use soft and landing in the same sentence, right? And and Stanley <laughs> Druckenmiller came out yesterday, finally, and yep. said, you know, well, we're in for a hard landing. Well, dude, well, have you been asleep for the last six months? <laughs> I mean, hello, everyone's been talking about it. And I'm not saying that I want it to be a hard landing, but I just don't see how it's not going to be a hard landing. Now, mm -hmm. it, it, I don't. I'm not. You know, I'm not in the camp of Morgan Stanley that's calling for S and P three thousand, which is down eleven hundred points from where we are today, which is twenty five percent basically. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in the camp that you know we're going to see a pullback. We're going to see some volatility if we test the lows of uh, what were they? The March lows of thirty eight hundred. I think that's probably about where we go, and we kind of churn for a little bit as we figure out how long and deep this is going to really be. 
Yeah. So, so Kenny, so you're thinking maybe a little bit of a choppier summer. Uh, you now you mentioned the so we were looking at the Nasdaq. You know, one thing that has me concerned, but you know, obviously the Nasdaq is very resilient, the leading, uh, the leader of the two indexes here. But the one thing that kind of has me concerned is it's still a pretty narrow rally. What What are your thoughts about that? It, first of all, can I say I love your Arusha. I just want to put that out there so everyone knows that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, no, I think that's always the problem, right? Because it's you're right. It's four or five names that are carrying the whole the whole sector, and so right. that is a concern. Although you know what's interesting um, is that t- obviously there are a lot of the big uh, the big mega cap names that are doing it, and then you got anything that puts artificial intelligence either in their name or on their front yes. page or on their website, or they mention it 25 times in their earnings call. That you know those are the names that are, that are at least seeing uh, some bumps, but. I mean, look at look at uh, look at a name like Nvidia, right? I mean, mm-hmm. back at Crush last year it was down 40, 40 or forty five percent. It's up ninety three percent this year um, on the back of not only like we said earlier, right? They crushed all those names last year in anticipation of what they thought the Fed was going to do. The Fed's doing exactly what they said, uh, and now they're they've rallied nicely, right? And uh, but yes, to your point, you have to be a little bit nervous about the narrowness of the of the strength, right? Because yeah. really, if you peel back the onion past those four or five big names, um, there's some turmoil still going on. And I think that's why, that's why, you know, I say to everybody, as much as I love this and I love, listen, I'm invested, so I'm participating. The market goes up, that's great. I love it because I'm invested. I'm not missing out. But I think you still have to remain, you know, on the cautious side, right? And, uh, you know, I guess you also have to talk about who you are and where you are, not only in the life cycle, but on the risk scale, right? I'm no longer 30. I'm 60, so uh, you know I'm going to tend to be a little bit more conservative and defensive. You have mm-hmm. a 30 or 35 or a 40 year old; they've got 30 years in front of them. Right. Go for it, go all in, <laughs> right? Because that, I mean, because uh, I think that's the right thing to do. I don't think yeah. it's, uh, you know, again. So, so part of this conversation is understanding who you are and where you are in the cycle, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Now, now, so with with all of this said, okay, you've got the you've got kind of a narrow market that's working right now. Um, a little bit of sector rotation underneath the surface, kind of uh, as money is you know looking for a home. You know, is it is it is it here in the medical area, which we've been seeing kind of get strong. I mean, the staples were getting strong a little bit. Yep. So, I guess what what are you looking for, Kenny, to kind of tell you, hey, this is more of a all clear uh, kind of remove that caution. Uh, cautious side of yourself. So I, I don't, for me, the all clear sign is not going to happen until a, I see them officially call the recession because I think they have to at some point. I think mm-hmm. they, I, I think we, I, there's no way we can escape and they're never going to call a recession. I just don't see how that's happened. The yield curve has been inverted for 17 months. And when it gets <laughs> inverted last February of 2022, they yeah. stood up there and they go, oh my God, the yield curve inverted <laughs> after three hours. And then they go, well, it usually takes 12 to 16 months. Guess where we are today That's at the 16th point. month, yeah. right? Yeah. So somebody better, you know, put up or shut up because this is what history tells us, right? They all told us 12 to 16 months. Well, here we are. We're knocking on the door of 16 months. So, uh, so A, I think they need to call it, right? And then I think they need to see um, whether or not the Fed pauses. Now, I think they're going to raise in Ju- June and then pause because then now we'll get the terminal rate right up to or equal to inflation. And remember, a lot of the economists and analysts are telling us that the Fed needs to get the terminal rate above inflation in order to be able to crush us. Well, right now we're just beneath it. You know, CPI today was what? 4.9 on the on the on the ex food and energy, but it was still 5.5 at the at the at the top rate, right? The top line rate. Um, and so the terminal rate is just below that. So that's why I continue to think we're going to see one more time because that'll get us to five and a quarter, five and a half. Uh, and that puts us right there. And then I think they're going to pause and then they're going to give it time to, to, for the market to digest. And so as long as they pause, in my mind, as long as they pause, then I think you're going to start to see, you know, some more stability put in. You're going to see them building a base. If they indicate that they raise in June and that, you know, potentially they're going to raise in July, the market's not expecting that. And that's when you're going to see some volatility. I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. But I would like to see that. That's what I want to see before I'm saying I get less cautious. But look, I'm always just because of because of who I am in terms of my my life cycle, I'm always going to lean a little bit more defensive than not because I'm approaching the end of the game. 
right? Now, that doesn't mean I'm not going to leave it for my kids or whatever's left over. That's fine. But until I get to that point, who knows? I might, I might need it all, right, to take care of me in my final years. I have no idea. But, uh, but until then, I'm going to remain a little bit more defensive. It doesn't mean I don't have exposure to, you know, tech. I do. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, or communications or energy. I have, I have exposure to all those places, but I'm mm-hmm. overweight in the defensive names that you make sense, right? Consumer staples, for sure, I'm overweight. Uh, healthcare, energy, financials, and, and within those sectors, and within actually all the sectors, I'm in the big mega cap names because those are the ones that, you know, those are the ones that will weather the storm the best because, yeah, if an asset manager needs to raise a lot of money really quick, what does he do? He sells Apple or he sells Amazon. Why? Because he can, and they're big mega cap names. Right. And so he can raise a lot of money very quickly. You can't sell, you know, the mid cap or small cap names and raise any significant money very quickly. And so, um, um, uh, you know, in my mind, the the big mega cap names, while they might come under some pressure, they're not going to come under the pressure that some of these other names are going to come under. And mm-hmm. they'll rebound. And they'll rebound faster. And by the way, they're good dividend payers for the most part. Yeah. Right. So, so Kenny, does this time period remind you of any other time period uh, uh, that that you've gone through? Well, listen, I, sure it does, but it, it's not. You know, I heard somebody today saying, I forget who it was, that you know this could be as bad as two thousand eight. Are you kidding me? This is not nearly as bad as 2008. By any I don't, I, I don't see the market losing 60 percent mm-hmm. over the next four or five months. Do you? I mean, I don't, unless the bond completely falls out. Right. I just don't see it. Right. But there are other times. Listen, it's a cycle, right? The market is made. The economy is made to go through cycles. This one, I think, uh, the reason I think this one's going to be a little bit longer, uh, and maybe remind me more of, you know, pullbacks in. Uh, uh, early 2000, okay. um, yeah. uh, or or uh, kind of the, in the mid 90s when we saw the market price right. pull back a little bit. Um, I, I think that's where it's going to be, right? Because look, we've we've stimulated for way too long. The Fed, when when CPI busted up and threw two percent, which was their target in April of 2021, they kept stimulating, saying, "Oh no, you know, I have to tell you this. It was transitory. Transitory, my ass." Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, they they voided their own rule. They said the minute it does that, we're going to become more restrictive. In fact, they didn't. And so they they pushed and pushed and pushed it for an additional 12 months. Yeah. And so now the pullback is going to be a little bit more uncomfortable and painful. Yet for the long-term investor, that pain will create opportunity. And for me, that opportunity is going to be, you know, I'm going to stick to the more defensive large cap names, right? Mm-hmm. When I think when I think the bottom's in and I want to go out further on the risk scale, yeah, but I'm not there yet. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you bring up an interesting point here, Kenny. I mean, uh, did the Fed lose a little bit of a credibility? Uh, you know, are they having a credibility issue right now? Because Ooh. there was that whole, oh, this is what we're going to do, kind yeah. of, and they were a little late in reacting. And now the market is kind of, putting in like for rate cuts by the end of this year okay first of all that's a whole nother conversation we could spend the whole podcast on (laughs) because i don't know what they're smoking if anybody thinks there's 73 25 base point cuts coming you know starting in july they're going to raise until june and then they're going to cut in july just think about that for one minute how ridiculous that sounds and by the way large asset managers i forget who it was i think uh, bloomberg put out a poll last week or Reuters put out a poll last week, and they canvassed you know, all these large asset managers across the country, asking them about their expectation. Not one of them, not one of them is pricing in or, or figuring in a, a rate cut. I don't, you know who it is. I, I don't know who it is really, but I guess the trader types that don't really understand. Because remember, look, I, I'll just say it for what it is. There's a whole generation of people that only know zero interest rates because they came <laughs> into this business in yeah. 2007 when yep. interest rates were zero. Yeah. And the Fed was stimulating. They weren't here in you know prior to prior to that. They were too, they weren't born in 1979. <laughs> they didn't understand it. So what I'm saying, I think a lot of those people are like, okay, okay, we've had enough pain. It's time to cut rates. That's cut rates is bullshit. It's not gonna cut rates. Not right. at least in 2023. Right. Left. Are they gonna cut rates in 2024? Potentially. First of all, it's an election year. Come on, who's getting who? Um, but second of all, by the time 2024 comes, as long as they hold rates at this level, which I think they're going to, they've been very clear on that. I think the mm-hmm. Fed and members of the Fed have been very clear on the fact that they're going to hold them there. Uh, Loretta Mester, Jimmy Bullard, uh, yeah. Neil Kashkari, all these people. The only one you haven't heard from is Mary Daly. Huh? You wonder why? 
Silicon Valley Bank collapsed right under her nose. So she's been hush hush quiet. She said nothing in the last month and a half, but that's a whole other conversation, which I'm happy to have if you want to have it. <laughs> if we want to open that can of worms. Oh, did you really want to open that can of worms? But anyway, um, so I think uh I think that's 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 what I think people have to be prepared for is that they're going to hold them there and keep them there. And these people that think we're getting rate cuts, I just don't. I, I honestly, I don't see it. I really don't. And I try to. I, okay, what? May I'm missing something? I mean, could I really be missing something? Because I think there's a seventy five percent as of today. I think they report they reported on on the on Fox and CNBC three wow. twenty five basis point rate cuts. Yeah. before Christmas. And I'm sitting there going, okay, wait, maybe I missed a really big headline. I don't, let me go look again. Well, are, are they assuming that there are going to be more banks that, that start collapsing yeah. and everything starts okay. uh, contagion okay. or something like that? Well, th listen, I suppose they could be. And do I think the banking crisis is completely over yet? You know, I don't think it's completely over. We may get one or two more that, you know, struggle. But I do think um, that uh, for the most part, I, I think that nervousness that they created, you know, at the very beginning, all the VCs, by the way, all the guys who funded and were Silicon Valley Bank are the same guys that brought it down. Yeah. They yeah. were the ones. Create, gonna write let's all create the, a run. The, let's yeah. create. You know what? And honestly, they should all be, they should all be, they, you, you should follow the money. You should see who benefited from that collapse. Right. They all because they did it to FRC, you know, the, the two days later, and then right. they tried to do it to the industry. So quite honestly, I think they should be looking at all those VCs, all those guys that, you know, that lit the place on fire. I think they should look at all those trade accounts and see who benefited from a collapse in the system like that, because that's baloney. Don't even get me started on that because we could talk about that for the whole hour. <laughs> right. Looks like oh, we're gonna. Have five it, it, it sounds like we have episode. like four podcasts. Yeah. In the we're gonna have a five-hour <laughs> podcast. By the way, is this is this video? I yes, mean, it yes, it is video, video oh, and so, uh, audio. Although most so people everyone's going to see, everyone's going to see all my. Well, reactions. that's that that they want to see that, Kenny. <laughs> that's they what they tune in that. for, Kenny. That's what they tune in for. So, um, oh you know, God. we're going to take a break right now, and when we come back, because you know, you are talking about some of these banking crises, and again, crises that you've been a part of before, and uh, how you handle yourself through those. And okay, wait, not caught. that I've caused when you said I've been a part of. Make sure you want <laughs> right, exactly the of that. <laughs> witnessed and <laughs> and. Yes. And gotten through, yes. yes. I, I don't. Yes. Yeah, I don't want to pin any scandals on Ken. No. You know, we're not, we're not here. We're, we're not that type of gotcha podcast. So. <laughs> okay. Well, well, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, trader. With inflation, interest rates, and the recent banking crisis, are you nervous about what's coming in the stock market? If you're ready to take control of your trading and forecast trends instead of reacting to them, then Vantage Point's artificial intelligence is for you. Did you know Vantage Point's AI predicted the trends of all the collapsing banks weeks in advance? Visit www.freestockcoaching.com to learn how you can predict trends with up to 87.4% proven accuracy. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com. That's www.freestockcoaching.com. Okay, and welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, along with Arusha Pires, who joins me every week from O'Neill Global Advisors. He's a portfolio manager over there. And we have Kenny Polkari, who is a chief market strategist at Slatestone Wealth and just a wealth of knowledge himself. And, uh, you know, we, we, we touched on a couple of things here, Kenny, in our last segment um, between, uh, you know, the portfolio construction and how you kind of uh, have different different points in your life. And so you have to kind of adjust accordingly. But what I really kind of want to drill down into here is how you remain calm during a crisis. And it seems maybe oxymoronic that we're talking to Kenny about being calm because, I mean, <laughs> you know, you're gesturing wildly and everything like that. But the reality is, you know, when it comes to your investing, you really do kind of take an unemotional approach to it. So uh, how do you do that? And how do you advise your clients in terms uh, okay. of Okay, let me calm? just let me just be honest with you, because I appreciate that. It took a long time for me to be able not to be emotional, right? When you're younger, you're more emotional, right? You got more mm -hmm. testosterone, so you're more emotional. Um, so I think part of it is because I've gotten older and less testosterone, I'm less emotional. But um, it took a long time to not be nervous every time there was bad news out of the market sold off when you were younger and you were putting money to work. Oh, my God, you know, you're going to lose everything. It, it, you, I, it, it, it takes time to get over that. That's not, it's not really easy. Uh, you can't just say to somebody, you know, get over it and don't be so emotional. It takes people have to get there on their own right now. In this case, like this in this latest turmoil that we're in now, 
you know, I've got now that I'm on the the money management side of the business versus the transaction side that I spent 40 years on, I'm now on the money management side. So now you become, you know, a wealth advisor, a wealth manager. You talk to people, you bring them in off the ledge sometimes if they get nervous. And, you know, listen, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and all that crisis that surrounded it created a lot of phone calls. With yeah. clients, A, wanted right. to know, A, did we have exposure? What what exposure? You know, if it wasn't Silicon Valley Bank, what other banks did we own that were regionals that weren't big money center banks? I got a call one night from a woman who said to me, she just wanted to sell everything and, and, and she didn't know what to do with her money. I said, okay, take a deep breath, slow down. First of all, you don't have any exposure to the regional banks. You've got, you have banks, but they're the big money center banks. And those are the ones that are at this moment that are going to be the winners. So yeah. number one, calm down. Number two, even if the broader market sells off, once again, your, your portfolio is positioned, right? You're more defensive. We built that up, not because we knew this crisis was coming, but because of where we are just in the, in the last year, right? Between the Fed and policy and, and the administration and the spending and the not spending, whatever. Um, and so we built that. So don't, don't panic. And so quite honestly, look where we are. The, the market's been trading really in a very tight range if you look at it over the last three or four months. It hasn't really gone... You know, 4165 on the upside and 4100 maybe on the downside over the well, 4050 on the downside. You know, if you go look at the chart. And so it's been in a really tight uh, range. And so we talked about that and I talked her in off the ledge and, you know, let's not make an emotional decision. But ultimately, if she was that nervous and she wanted out, then we're going to move it into treasuries, right? We're just going to put it into short duration T bills that we're earning, you know, 5% on three and six month T bills if she was that nervous. Something I told her she shouldn't do. But if ultimately the decision is, is hers. Um, and so, in fact, she didn't. Right. She 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 took a step back. She took a deep breath. She tr she's younger than me. She trusted my advice and my judgment and kind of my insight. Um, and so I had a lot of those conversations, as I'm sure so many wealth managers had those conversations with clients. Right. Maybe the younger ones weren't so weren't so concerned because they didn't nearly have you know a ton of money at risk. Um, and maybe they, you know, maybe they're just less concerned. Right. Um, but for the most part, it was, uh, it's been an interesting time, but it's been that way, um, for a while, but I'll tell you back in, you know, back in 1987, when the market crashed, we lost 22 and a half percent in six and a half hours. I was only 26 years old. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have anything to lose other than the house we just bought. So I didn't have extra cash. I didn't have a lot in my retirement account, so I didn't have a lot to lose, but I witnessed you know, when I was on the floor and I thought all these guys that were 60 years old at the time then who saw the market crash. And remember, when the market crashed in 87, it was the index that was down 22.5%. But you had individual names that got absolutely slaughtered on that day. Johnson & Johnson, which is, you know, big mega cap name. Everybody owns it, right? Um, that stock had closed at $96 on the Friday night before the 16th. On the Monday night, the 19th, Johnson & Johnson closed at $45. It literally lost 50% of its value in one day. Now, partly because you remember the, 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 the you know, the, 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 the craziness that we, oh, were you guys there in 1987? Were you, um, I was, I was in junior high. Okay, uh, so you weren't so, there. Yeah. <laughs> in a room. Okay, so but so, I, I got to say, your story on it, I think, paints the best picture because I've heard your story a number well, of times. Well, yeah, Go ahead. And, and so and so, you know, you witness you, you, when you saw things like Johnson and Johnson lose fifty percent of its value. You know, first of all, a, it was it was clearly concerning. How could that possibly happen? But when you think of it, it's because they couldn't sell the other stuff. Like I said, I keep using Bank of Hawaii because who wants Bank of Hawaii? And so you can't sell it. So these asset managers that were directed to raise cash, raise cash, raise cash to protect the portfolio because they all bought that portfolio insurance. Yep. They sold what they could. And so those big mega cap names got crushed, crushed. But they were also the first ones to rally right back because they got so artificially dislocated that they mm -hmm. bounced right back. And as ugly as it was and as uncomfortable as it was, um, what you realize is when you go back and you look at it, you know, that was such an overreaction and so many names were dislocated. It really was an opportunity. And so I would say that to anybody like, like some of the regional banks that got really beaten up. I said, quite honestly, there are some names in the regional banking industry that I really like that are not going to be affected because they're not serving that tech sector. They're not located in California and Silicon Valley. New York community bank was, you know, was one of those names that got completely slaughtered was a name that I liked. And so, you know, it's a matter of having that conversation and bringing, quite honestly, the wealth of experience and time and grade and maturity to the conversation. And I don't mean maturity like they're not mature. What I mean is 
time and grade, that yeah. kind of maturity, right? right? The experience. Expo the experience, right. Yeah. The experience that I've had over the 40 years and understanding um, that unless the story fundamentally changes on an individual name, um, when the stock gets dislocated, it's not because of the fundamentals that change, it's get dislocated because, you know, some of these big asset managers are raising cash. So Apple gets, you know, down 18%. Amazon goes down 25%. But guess what? Amazon's not going out of business. Apple's not yeah. going out of business. Those, those declines, in my mind, present opportunities for the long-term investor. And if you're a day trader, you, you know, you love, the, you, love the, you love the noise, right? You love the noise. But as a long-term investor, you actually, actually, actually have to eliminate the noise. And the noise is hard to eliminate today because there's so much of it, right? It's on Twitter. It's on LinkedIn. It's on Bloomberg. It's on Reddit. It's on Discord. It's on all these places that give people all this information and access that it creates a lot of noise. And so the toughest part about, especially in a market sell-off, is you know, trying to decipher what's the noise and what isn't, right? And what's really important in this case and what isn't. And I always use that analogy, you know, like when a name like Apple or Amazon or Google or Johnson & Johnson or Coca-Cola, when these names sell off and people go, oh my God, I have to sell my Apple. Oh, oh, oh. When, when, when Nordstrom puts a, has a sale and puts, you know, the ladies' dresses on sale down 30%, the women run in and buy three of them because how could they leave them on the shelf? They can't. They're down 30%. I say to myself, use that same logic when you're talking about Apple and Amazon and Johnson and Johnson and Microsoft. Use that same logic. Unless, of course, the fundamental story of that stock has changed. And if it hasn't, then that logic always carries you through. In the end, yeah. you will be, you will be better off, and especially the other thing is that you until you get to the point where you need maybe the dividend, the dividends as income, you should automatically be signing up for dividend reinvestment. Just, just with your eyes shut, you buy the stock, you go into your account, make sure that you are automatically signed up for dividend reinvestment, and then you just shut your eyes and just let it go. You know, keep keep consistent to the plan. It's all about the plan, right? Have that long term goal always in sight and try to eliminate the noise in, in, the, in the middle, you know? Well, you know what? I want to kind of dig a little deeper here on uh, the, the, the opportunities versus the ones that, you know, I, using your Nordstrom example, there are sometimes some of the dresses are just crap, you know, either they're just <laughs> exactly. out of style and, 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 and you, you, you don't want to touch them. Eggs, right? And you don't, <laughs> then you don't, you go in there and you go not, but, <laughs> but at a price, down 30% may not be right. But if it goes down 50%, someone's going to say, ah, you know what? I'm going to take a shot on this. Yeah. Right? The uh -huh. same thing in stocks. The thing could be off 20% and someone goes, eh, I think it's got more to go. So I'm not there yet. Yeah. Right? At a certain but point, you, you, better... can, you can just use them as rags. Right. You know, you don't exactly. have to use them as dress anymore. <laughs> exactly. But here's, the, but here's the other point is that people have to remember. I always find this amazing because when the market sells off hard, who goes, oh, my God, everyone's selling. Well, that's really impossible. That's a, that's a misnomer. Because in order for me to sell, somebody has to buy. Otherwise, the market doesn't function. So for right. every seller, there is a buyer. And so the difference is when the market sells off like that is that the buyers see it coming. They see this avalanche of people running at them. So instead of bidding 50, they go, why do I want to get run over? So they draw their bid and they bid 48 or they bid, right? I mean, I'm being right. dramatic when I talk about the price. It, but that's exactly what happens. But though, that's right? exactly. And listen, but it happens the other way too, because when True. the data suddenly turns and becomes positive, the sellers are in control. That's mm -hmm. when, what, when, when the market's on a rally, it's the sellers who are in control, not the buyers. And when the market's under pressure, it's the buyers who are in control. Right. Because the buyer, because you're the one who's so anxious to sell it. I go, ah, I'm licking my lips. Okay, here I go. You know, you're down 2% or whatever it is. You make your bids and, and that's, and so that's how the market functions. So I, that's another point that I try to always make investors aware you're not in this alone there's somebody on the other side of every trade so while you think it's a sell i may think it's a screaming buy yeah right we're down 18 percent. why wouldn't i buy apple down 18 percent? no it doesn't mean i'm doesn't mean i'm taking all my money and buying apple all today i don't i feather it in over time i'll buy a little bit here i'll wait until it reacts because now i'll buy more i'm always averaging down on my costs right if the stocks i own are trading above my average cost i let them trade unless there's some important reason I run right in after them and want to buy more. But most of the time I let them trade if they're above when they come below my average price and I'll start to buy more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just, the, that, no, that's just me. That's how I kind of, yeah. you know, and then the other thing that I do to offset without getting complicated, you know, coming up with all these complex strategies, I just use some of the contra 
contra trades to give me downside protection. So, for instance, the PSQ gets you short uh, the NASDAQ. The SH gets you short the S&P. So you buy the SH to get short the market. Mm -hmm. Or you buy the PSQ to get short the NASDAQ, right? Or you buy the VIXI, the VIXI, which is a play on the fear index, right? So you want to go long the VIXI if you think suddenly fear is going to shoot higher, the market's going to sell off. The VIXI, you know, that could be up 15% in one day, like with your eyes shut. And so I use those kinds of products to offset uh, my long portfolio. I don't, I, I don't, I, I rarely sell anything. And the only reason I would sell any of the stocks I own is because the fundamental story has changed. And that's the lesson I try to bring. Those are the conversations I have with people, you know, when they get in, I don't, I don't, you know, when I'm allocating or, or helping people manage money, it's very much a conversation. You know, it's like you and I, it's like, you know, husband and wife, you're having this conversation, you're making these decisions together. Now I may be guiding them because they don't understand it, but they're very much part of the conversation. Yeah. Right. yeah. And, and it's really how, how, question asking, you know, you're asking the right questions. Right. Right. Correct. And, and how were those conversations last year when it, it was uh, obviously this year we've been bottoming and, yeah. and going sideways and getting more tight and things yeah, like yeah. that. Last year last they were year. difficult. Yeah. Last yeah. year they were difficult. Let's be honest. Cause the market, the market sucked last year. I mean, the yeah. was down 35% the, the, right. the Dow, the, I mean, the, although the Dow did the best out of, out of all of them, but, um, the Nasdaq and the S&P did get crushed. And so they were difficult conversations to have. Yeah. And because you couldn't, you know, you, you couldn't make the market go up under that. Yeah. And so all you had to do was continue to, there were a lot of conversations. You just spoke to people more often than you. When the market goes up, people go, ah, you don't need to call me. But when right. the market's down, they want to talk to you every day. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. And so exactly. there were a lot of conversations. And they were, some were very difficult to have because uh, people were very nervous, right? Especially mm -hmm. people, people, you know, at my end of the scale were very nervous. Um, and so some people did, in fact, make, you know, make requests to want to become even more defensive. Let's get, let's get out some names and just put them in treasuries. I want to just, I just want to be in treasuries. Okay. Right. And, and so you, as a, you do it, um, you do it because it's ultimately their money and, right. and that's what they want to do. So you want them to be comfortable, right? If you keep fighting them on it, say, no, no, no. And it goes down, down, down. Then, you know, <laughs> they come back and they say to you, uh, -uh I told you I didn't want to do <laughs> yeah. that. So, exactly. you know, you have to respect what they say. Um, as long as you have a conversation, about it. I'll end in the end, I'll do what you want me to do, but I'll, but I'm going to have a long conversation with you about why it is what we have and what we think. And, you know, it, but it was, let's be honest, it was a difficult year last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, can you con contrast that kind of idea of, I mean, last year, it was a market where, you know, you'd had some rallies, but then we kept on going to, to new lows. Right. And again, I would imagine, especially for those that are on the, on the older side, that being really kind of tough because you're like, okay, if this just keeps on going lower and lower, right. how long does it take for me to get back? You know, what I, what I lost. <laughs> well, now, yeah, go ahead. Well, okay. So to your point, if you do absolutely nothing, uh, meaning if you don't take new money and dollar cost average down, bring your cost down. If you do nothing and you just leave your cost, it's going to take you a whole lot longer to get back. Right. Yeah. Because, right. But if you are, you know, putting new money to work in the, in the best of the names that mm -hmm. are coming under pressure, you're bringing your dollar cost average down. So therefore the, the, the rally back takes less time. Yeah. It takes time for sure. But as long as you're comfortable in the names that you own, and as long as the stories for why you own them, have not really fundamentally changed, that's when you have to convince somebody that the right thing to do is to continue to put money to work in this name, right? Mm -hmm. And I had this conversation, I was at the Forbes Investor Conference last week, and, and, and you know, somebody in the crowd asked about NVIDIA. NVIDIA is a perfect example, right? The semis were getting crushed last year, and NVIDIA is a big popular name, and that was down you know, 40% at the end of the year last year, but it was a name that I like, and it was a name that I own. It was a name that, you know, as difficult as it was, I kept going, oh, it hurts every time I buy a little bit more. But I said, I'm in this for the long haul. The story for NVIDIA has not really changed. Mm -hmm. And so look at it today. It's up 96% this year, right? So, and 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 I've not only exceeded because I, I kept buying it, so my average cost came down. So now, I'm well, once again, I'm well above my average cost. And so therefore, it, it came back quick. Now, had I not done that, I wouldn't even be back to my average cost yet. You well, know what yeah. I mean? It's just, so so that that's the part that you have to you know be able to express and be able to discuss um, and get somebody really comfortable with. And that and that really happens when you have really high quality in an environment like this. You want to have high quality names 
uh, in your portfolio. Now, NVIDIA in this case is not a, it's a very small dividend payer, I think, right? It's not a, it's not a big dividend payer, but, um, right. You know, in the other, in the other, some of the other big names, IBM, right? General Electric, uh, not General Electric, American Telephone, which is a really boring name. It's a really boring name, but it's a, it's nearly a seven percent dividend. General Mo, uh, uh, American Telephone, um, and it's mostly a good store of value for somebody, right? Because it doesn't really move a whole lot. They pay you a significant amount to own it. Um, and you just keep reinvesting, and I did. And I did that because listen, it's it, it. I'm still under the water a little bit in, in my telephone from where I started buying it, but I'm closer. I'm closer than I was, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just because you you stick with the plan, yep. right? You don't veer off the plan and decide you're going to change the rules. Yeah. Right. So now in 2020, were you having those? Did you have to uh, calm people down at, at, at that point when everything was working? Well, and you, mean everyone, when you mean when COVID hit? When COVID hit and when the markets just took off, did you have to kind of have different conversations? Say, hey, you know, things are getting way out of control and people are probably taking too much risk and, and yes. things like that? Yes, but remember that, you know, first we went through March when, when right. COVID first yes. hit and yes. the market got yes. crushed. And right. so when the rally back, people were anxious, you know, they, oh, I'm going to make my money back. It was that whole thing about, you know, I'm right. there, I'm there, I can feel it, I can feel it. But you did have the conversation about how it had gotten extended, you know, and how it had gotten too far too fast. But um, on the way up, it's always funny. When stocks are going up, it's not nearly the same conversation as when they are when, when they're coming under pressure, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, very different. Well, thanks for that. And uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the stocks that are on Kenny's radar right now. So stay tuned. Hey, trader. With inflation, interest rates, and the recent banking crisis, are you nervous about what's coming in the stock market? If you're ready to take control of your trading and forecast trends instead of reacting to them, then Vantage Point's artificial intelligence is for you. Did you know Vantage Point's AI predicted the trends of all the collapsing banks weeks in advance? Visit www.freestockcoaching.com to learn how you can predict trends with up to 87.4% proven accuracy. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com. That's www.freestockcoaching.com. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, along with Arusha Pires, who joins me every week from O'Neill Global Advisors, a portfolio manager over there. And then, of course, on the show this week, we've got Kenny Polcari, chief market strategist at Slate Stone Wealth and a long-term uh, member of the New York Stock Exchange floor uh, team that was uh, doing all that trading in the 80s, 90s, thousands and gosh beyond so <laughs> yeah it does really it does really sound like a long time when you put it that way doesn't it uh, yeah. uh, so <laughs> kenny's just kind of laid out his strategy in terms of how he remains calm during crisis and again it's this long-term plan the idea of averaging down on some of these um companies that you know will trade at a discount that you know aren't going anywhere and so maybe we can start out this conversation with a few ideas and uh kenny wanted to start off with amazon.com a-m-z-n uh the retail giant Yes, it's been uh, trading below its 200-day or 40-week moving average line for a while here. Uh, yeah. Just poked above it again this week. Um, so t tell me your thoughts on this one, Kenny. So listen, I think that this is, uh, you know, this stock, so as of today, is up uh, about 34% year to date, right? But like you said, if you look at it for the whole the whole first five months of the year, it's trading a very, very tight range after last year having, having gotten beaten up with a lot of the tech names, right? Um, yeah. It's been trading, and I think it's it's been given a great opportunity as it struggled around its 50, 100, 200-day uh, trend lines. Now, it just broke up and through uh, its 200. Uh, you know, it did it the other day, then it tested it. It backed off a little bit, traded back down to the back down to its uh, intermediate term, and now it's bounced up again. And today, it's bounced higher. And as a matter of fact, I think it was last week, and I forget which, which asset manager, a big asset manager came out, you know, uh, actually um, – no, it wasn't Buffett. I was going to say Buffett, but it's not Buffett. Um, uh, that came out and was talking about the benefits of Amazon, how it's under undervalued and underpriced, and he's going all in on Amazon, a name that I own. I've owned it for a while, you know, and I and I, on weakness, I keep buying more because it's Amazon. I don't think Amazon's going anywhere. The fundamental story really hasn't changed. There's a lot going on there in Amazon, so I'm now watching it as it has broken out, and so now I think it has successfully broken out above its 200 day. Um, mm -hmm. And I suspect that we're going to see it, uh, that we're going to see it continue to perform well. So it's a name I own. It's a name I like. I'll continue buying it. I'm just about where I own it right now. 
you know, tonight it closed at 110, 110 bucks. That's just about my, my price. So right in here, I'll continue to buy it. If it, if it really rallies much higher than this, I'll pull back and just wait and be patient because I own it. So if it rallies, I'm participating. It's all good. And that's how, that's kind of how you have to think of it, right? If it's rally, you haven't missed it because you own it. So you're participating. I mean, yeah. I, I suppose at that point you could always say, yeah, but I don't own enough. Well, that's all. Uh, you uh, well, never they, own that, enough when exactly, it's rally. Never. Exactly. But, but, you know, it is, uh, it is the way the game is played. Well, I mean, it's really interesting over the last like four or five months how Amazon has, as you said before, tightened up. Right. I mean, the character almost, uh, I mean, really kind of just went under this subtle change. Right. And, and this is the first time that it potentially might close above the 200 day Ooh, average. I, in, I, I think well, it did close year, above right? the 200 day. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, no, oh, this was... week, by, by the oh, end yeah. of the week. This might oh, be yeah, the yeah, first yeah. week that it actually might close in since uh, uh, 2021, the end of 2021, which is which is pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think, look, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I do so much on Amazon, right? It's yes. just oh, yeah. I'm it's tripping just over easier. boxes. Yeah. I, I, I've got so some boxes easy. in front of yeah, my house and, right you know, now. And, and you, I can order something at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's in my house by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Right. Yes. right. I mean, unless it's something I need right now, I, I could do it on Amazon. And listen, I everybody does it. And you see Amazon trucks everywhere down here in Florida. They are everywhere. And sometimes yes. you'll be in a stoplight and there's three Amazon trucks just waiting at the stoplight. <laughs> right. Yes, so, exactly. uh, you, you know, I view that as a huge uh, as a big positive sign for Amazon. Right. I, I don't think it's going away by any stretch. Um, and the convenience of it alone um is well worth it. Never mind their cloud services and, and all the other right. stuff that I think add to that story, right? Uh, yeah, and, and then the, the and AI, artificial, right? That's right. Artificial intelligence. <laughs> Again, good. you know, how many times did we hear during this reporting season, you know, any company, not just Amazon, but all the companies, the more they mentioned AI, the more the stock ticked up, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, Rush, like I said to you, it reminds me of the dot-com bubble in 1999, Absolutely. right? Yes. In 1999, yeah. if you put dot-com after your name, you know, it was, it was easily worth 50% more the next day. It was dumb. Mm -hmm. Now, and I, while I think, you know, we're reliving that, you know, AI, 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 artificial intelligence, you know, they keep saying it. And they, uh, I do think, though, that um, that AI is now at the point we've seen it, right? Chat, GBT, and Bard, yes. and all these other things that artificial intelligence is doing. Um, I, I think it's, I, it's certainly that genie's out of the bottle. It's not going back. Um and 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 it no, seems like it's only getting started too, like with the chat GPT. It's yeah, absolutely it's only getting it's right, very right. much in its infancy right. stages, right? So so companies like Amazon are gonna take full advantage of that, as they should. Listen, right. all these companies are gonna start taking full advantage. The banks are talking about their artificial intelligence yeah. and you yeah. know, I mean, listen, and the banks are very much technology companies as well as banks. Who's kidding who? Right? right. And right. so, um, and so, for that reason, I like Amazon. I think it's like you said; it might close above its two hundred. I think if it closes above its two hundred this week, that's a really bullish sign for mm -hmm. Amazon. I can go back and see who the um, actually, or maybe, maybe uh, one of you guys could look it up. But one, some really big asset manager came out really bullish, was going all in on Amazon, and said that it was uh, uh, completely undervalued. Um, now, now, Kenny, do you remember the first time you saw the Amazon website back in the? the 90s yeah, yeah. like how yeah. rough it was and it was just hard to wrap your head around like why would anyone be well, it was only books this? but you remember know, it was like, only it's, books when well, yeah, it, first it was only credit books. card on, on <laughs> right. Online, right all this right. stuff right right well that was true of any site that wanted your yeah. credit card right exactly. how crude how really how crude it was yeah right mm -hmm. um um, but, so that listen, might be kind of the same thing with the chat GPT where it's, it's pretty basic right uh, now, but it's mind blowing. Well, it, but you say it's pretty basic. Well, yep. agreed. You say it's pretty basic, but really when you think about what it could do today, I was exactly. just playing with it because, exactly. because uh, I wanted to go and I was watching, there was a story about chat GPT and I go, you know, let me just go try a couple of things. So I, I, you know, I went into chat GPT and I, you know, did a couple of queries in it. I mean, what it produces, it produces right away. Right away. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, and I'm and 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 you know, I'm gonna make you laugh because one of the things I did was I wrote in and I said, "Tell me a story about Kenny Polcari." I put it in there, chat you, and it comes back. Yes. It, it comes back in ten seconds. You know, <laughs> working on the floor of the exchange. He's a financial guy. You can see him in the crowd. He's on CNBC. I mean, That's all awesome. this stuff. Wow. It comes right back. It, listen, do, do it with your own name. Yeah. Because uh -huh. uh, you know, you're a portfolio manager at IBD. You've been quoted in this stuff. See what it says about you. But it's amazing. I'm scared. 
Just stuff. <laughs> right. no, 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 no. Well, so was I. That's really why I put it in there to see what came back. But none of the th- bad th- stuff. Th- came thank back. God the the internet was in its infancy during my college years. <laughs> Otherwise, it would have been a whole different story that it was. No, telling. but you know, I put things in there like um, you know questions about the market, questions about policy, questions about um, uh, economic policy yeah. to see what kind of. Now, look, a lot of the information that comes back is stuff that pulls from Wikipedia right. and it pulls from stories. But it's the speed at which yes. it puts it together and creates a readable story, yep. right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. so I think it's very much in its infancy stages. And I think, you know, I, 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 I shudder. I really do shudder to think what this conversation is going to be like even a year from now. It's true. Right? Yeah, I what mean, just imagine do, once the companies all, just like the websites, right? Yeah. Yep. Before, they were just, it was just an online brochure 30 yep. years ago. Right. Now, imagine what the, everyone's going to be doing with their own custom uh, chat gpt right using accurate data using accurate databases so it, right. it is as you said yeah in a year it, it's going to be fast. you're not going to know you know was it was it written by you know real thought by human right. being or was yeah. it written by, listen even today you can see it, it passes the bar exam right it takes an sat test it does all those things yeah. it's really it's really uh, you know and, and while on the one hand it's a little bit unnerving to me yeah. um it, it is very much in its infant stages and, and, you know, God only knows what it's going to be like, you know, I, listen, remember when we were kids, we used to watch the Jetsons and make fun of it. Yeah. That's yeah. where we're going. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be George Jetson. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, mean, I can't, I can't wait till I can have my own little Rosie. Uh, yeah. Rosie. Right. <laughs> so, Rosie. Um, well, since we're talking about the artificial intelligence, we should, Probably, you know, C- take a look at AI, uh, right? Which is you know, C three so AI, yeah, right? C three AI. Now, uh, and and again, I I, I kind of want to talk about a little bit of okay. So this one, this one is more in its infancy uh, in terms of a recent IPO. I mean, it just IPO'd in twenty twenty. Yeah. Um, and you know, we certainly had that back in the dot com days where we had these recent IPOs and they threw dot com on their name and went went crazy. Um, you had the Cisco's and Microsofts and things that were able to, you know, live through that and, yep. and flourish, uh, and then you had a bunch of stocks that went away. You know, you you don't you don't you don't even remember their names anymore. Listen, because uh, they don't exist. So this where does this one out, fall? Th- this one came out in December of what 2020. Uh, it traded as high as you know in the weeks after it came out. I think it came out at somewhere around 100 100 bucks or something like that. I forget. I didn't own it then. Oh, it traded. It, it was the high. Yep. A hundred and what? 183. 80. 183 was the yeah. high in this thing. Yep. And today it's trading back at 20 bucks. Now, look, you can see it. It's a, it was in a straight decline, really, all of 21 uh, and 22, certainly when tech was coming under under pressure. But I also think that you know, artificial intelligence then was it was it was still it was still it was still misunderstood or it wasn't understood well enough, right? So I think mm-hmm. it was a little bit ahead of itself, but um, it started to certainly now with ChatGPT and Bard and some of these other services that are coming out. You can start to see it's beginning to lift its head, um, uh, and so it's a name that I get into. I'm down the, I you know, I own it here in the low 20s, so you know, right around where I bought it. Um, but I think this is a name. This is one of those names for me that's outside of my defensive type portfolio. Right. I was just mm-hmm. going to ask that. But yeah. right, but it, it clearly does not fall into the defensive type of portfolio. But what it gives me, it gives me exposure to a part of the market where I think is going to be, you know, five or 10 years from now, it's going to be just like Google or Microsoft or Amazon, right? I don't own it. It's not a big part of my portfolio. It's 2% of my portfolio. So if I lose it, it's not going to crush me. It's not like it's 50% of my portfolio. Right, Absolutely right. not. So, um, so But it allows that, me to dip my toes in the water. Yeah. So going, so you have a, a 2% in an AI for like an AT and T, what would it be like, like a five percent or something like that? My eighteen, yeah, my AT and T position, I think, is just around five and a half percent right now, okay. right? So my, uh, I get my Nvidia though is a bigger position, partly yeah. because of its price and partly because, um, you know, my Nvidia position is probably closer to eleven percent. Okay, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, so that makes but, sense. Yep. Yeah, but um, my AI is just, you know, I'm watching it. I have exposure to it. I'm not overweighted. It is mm-hmm. outside of my. You know, I just said to you, I want to play more defensive. It's right. it's a small position outside of it because if it really takes off, you know, then I'll then I'll get some of the benefit. And if it doesn't, um, I, I'm not going to be I'm not going to be all the worse off for it, right? It's yeah, I mean, you market. managed a risk just yeah, with I've the smaller the position size, right? Yeah. I've managed a risk in it, and I'll wait and see. And it doesn't mean if this one, in fact, starts to take off. In fact, in fact, I might buy it above my average price just because if the story becomes, if I think 
like we just said, if the whole AI story uh, uh, starts to mature, which I think it's clearly going to do, then, you know, I don't want to necessarily get left behind. But right now I'm happy with just kind of watching it. And it's right here. I'm not I'm not making it. I'm not losing it right now. It's mm-hmm. just kind of right. It's just kind of right there. But I'm now, not I'm, but I'm not adding to it either at the moment. I want to see what it does. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, what what are you looking for on the fundamental side? Because, I mean, right now, this doesn't have earnings, you know. And, right. again, there were a lot of dot-coms that didn't have earnings and never were going to have earnings. But then you had those that did, well, you know. Yeah, listen, and, Amazon didn't have earnings. I don't think right, Amazon exactly, for a long earnings. time. <laughs> and, 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 and when they first were, you know, going public, it's like, we're not sure if they're ever going to have earnings. And yeah. they may not, but, you know, you loved it, you loved it, you loved it because it was a growth thing. This happens to just be in the sector that I think um, is going to start to change the world even more than it's already changed the world, right? So this seems to be, for me, kind of the purest play on a publicly traded uh, AI stock. I think there's a bunch of private AI companies that are going to end up going public yeah. that might end up giving you better or different exposure, but I can't get those right now, right? Because they're private, and uh, and so I can't get those. But um, at the moment, this one appears to be uh, a name that, gives me exposure to that space. Like I said, I think it's, you know, relatively cheap, you know, could it get down $20 and go to zero? Of course it could. Um, I I don't think that's going to happen, especially now that, you know, the more, the more everyone talks about it, like I just said, how many times did every company that report talk about the artificial intelligence that they're using? I think the biggest, I think the thing that makes me laugh the most is there's a commercial on TV. I don't know if you've seen it, probably you may not have seen it. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, a hair, company, right? The shampoo that, you know, helps you grow your hair back. And the guy gets on TV and said, because of the artificial intelligence we use, we can grow your hair. I want to, I want to laugh. I go, Are you fucking kidding me? Are you kidding me? Artificial intelligence, let me grow my hair back in a shampoo. Come on, dude. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> but but whatever. But the point is, they're all saying it. Every company saying AI, AI, artificial intelligence. However, we can squeeze it in. It, oh, right? that's really funny. <laughs> but no, but but it is funny. I don't yeah. think I've ever seen the commercial. But I have not. That's and it's so funny. And the guy says it with like such a straight face <laughs> about the artificial intelligence that we put in our shampoo. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but. <laughs> that's what you know, but that doesn't mean that's not why I own C three AI. It's just the, but it's the, it's the idea of how artificial tell those words uh, are permeating every conversation we have. I mean, I don't think you can go through a day without saying artificial intelligence. Yeah, anybody right. you're talking oh, yeah. to, oh, yeah. right? For sure. Yeah. I mean, everybody's saying it now. You know, that could be like the dot com because all those times, you know, back in the nineties, it was dot com, and then they all crashed and burned. Right. But remember. Yeah. Those were, I mean, pets.com. I mean, yes. really, right. this is, this is, C3.ai is, in fact, it's not pets.com. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And so um, I'm willing to, I'm willing to uh, throw some money at it, especially yeah. because it's, you know, it's trading at 20, down from 180. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. So maybe we can round out the conversation because you've talked a lot about being defensive. Um, so maybe we can end with a actual defense stock. You know, yes, uh, sir. So Lock- Lockheed Martin here, LMT is a ticker symbol. Um, now we were kind of talking at the break that man, it, it seemed like when the whole Ukraine situation uh, happened and 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 the, the 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 fighting began, and a lot of Europe started making commitments of, yeah, you know what, we're, we have to spend more money on defense because this is this is scary stuff going on here. Um, they didn't, you know, these defense stocks didn't move like we expected. So what's what's your take on them now? Well, no, but you know something, look at this. I, they haven't moved like expected, but if you go back to the start in in February of 21, when when uh, mm-hmm. when Vlad went in there, I mean, you look mm-hmm. at these, these stocks, are, these stocks have actually performed very nicely. Like I'll look at LMT in January of 21 or February of 21 till today, you know, it's up 30%, but it was up as high as 40% before it kind of backed off in this, in this last little sell off as the markets got a little bit nervous. So it has performed relatively well. Yeah. Um, but I would have thought it would have performed better, especially, you know, all that nervousness building up around uh, Russia and Ukraine and the threats of nuclear and all that stuff. Um, but I do think there's an opportunity because I uh, because I'm playing on the fact that I also think there's going to be a China Taiwan confrontation and that's going to you know whether or not it turns into a war or it doesn't turn into a war I do think and you've you've seen recent articles about you know some of the NATO company uh, countries uh, putting in big orders for uh, right. for de- for defense right Raytheon I think just got a big order Lockheed Martin I think just got another big order and so I think you're going to start to see some of these. Def- defense stocks um, 
turn their head up, especially if it starts to get a little bit un, a little bit more nervous around China and Taiwan, which I think is a real uh, is a real possibility. I don't want to see it happen, but I, I think Xi's made it very clear now that he's elected leader for life. Yeah, he's made it very clear that he intends on restoring China. And look what they did to Hong Kong. They took back Hong Kong, and everything was everyone was supposed to play nice in the in the sandbox. They didn't play nice in the sandbox, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so who's mm-hmm. kidding who? And, so, and nobody stopped them after that. After they handed the keys over to China, and suddenly China took it all back. Nobody stopped them from doing it. Now, there wasn't war. It just happened because now they own it again, right? So they can do what they want. I think Taiwan's a different issue. And Taiwan presents, I think, a problem for the world, right? Because we, as the world, outsourced all our semis to Taiwan. Yep. Right? And, uh, uh, and, and yeah, okay. So Intel's building a plant in Ohio. Great. It'll be ready in 2025. <laughs> right, and Samsung's building a plant in Texas. That'll be ready in 2025, right? Mm, so yeah. if something happens between before 2025 when we can build our own shit, this is potentially going to be a problem. Which is why, again, I like I like this I like the space. Um, again, I'm not overweight in the space, right? Uh, this is you know the defense, and I play the defensive names using ETF, not the individual name. But I okay. we're talking about individual names. I do like LMT, and it is part of the ETF. But again, that ETF, you know, the whole thing is about three and a half percent of my portfolio. But uh, I do like it as a sector. Uh, mm-hmm. And if you made me pick an individual name, I would probably pick LMT over you know General Dynamics or Raytheon, um, uh, because I think that's held up the best actually. Awesome. Yeah, sometimes it's nice just to go with the broader ETF because it's hard sometimes well, to say, hey, is, is Lockheed really better than ooh. Raytheon? Well, right. And in this case, I want, right. In this case, I, you know, I, I don't really know. I think they're yeah. all three. The General Dynamics, Raytheon, and Lockheed Martin are certainly three fine names in the defense industry here. So I get I get better exposure to them. And if I pick the wrong one, you know, if I, if I, if I picked one and it didn't yeah. happen to be the one that really outperformed, then, you know, in this case, I'm using ETF to to represent that sector in my portfolio. And which, which ETF are you, uh, you know, favoring right now, just in terms uh, of its, its the, construction? No, the, uh, the ITA, right. Which is the, the ITA, ITA. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. um, yeah, that's the one that I like. And that's the one that, uh, yeah, cause I know there's a few others. There's like XAR and, and so on, but yeah, yeah. No, um, I use the ITA, the iShares one right now. Yeah. Um, let me just see something. The iShares one, because I'll just because I want to be correct when I quote this to you. You know, Raytheon is a top holding, right? Then Boeing and Lockheed Martin, those are the three top holdings. Between those yep. three, that represents almost 50% of the ETF. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and then if you go down, you know, Northrop Grumman's in there, L3 Harris is in there, Textron's mm-hmm. all in there, but those are smaller percentages of the total of the total ETF. In this case, those first three are mm-hmm. 36, it's 40, 36, it's 44 percent of the of the ETF, you know? Yeah. Well, hey, Kenny, I got to say, it's always a pleasure having you on the podcast. It's always a great conversation, uh, amusing and informative and, and everything. Uh, also, just I want to make sure that people know that they can follow you on Twitter. What's what's the best uh, Twitter handle and YouTube ways they can get more, more Kenny? So my Twitter handle is just my name, Ken, at Kenny Polkari. Um, and you can see it because I'm there a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my YouTube channel is just Kenny Polkari Media. So go into YouTube and just type in all one word, Kenny Polkari Media, and uh, and you'll come up and you'll see my daily videos, which are really my my daily blog. It all gets posted on my Twitter channel and my Twitter site anyway. But um, you'll get the video version of my uh, of my written version. And, you know, you know me. I can be yeah. very demonstrative. Yes, and I, I, I highly <laughs> recommend the videos because, again, once once you've watched a few Kenny Polkari videos, and again, you, you do great analysis day by day, but then once you start reading the commentary, then you can just, it, it automatically comes out in Kenny's voice. Uh, so <laughs> it's, you definitely, you write the way you talk. Yeah, I, yeah I, well, yeah, and I do. So it's not all, it's not always grammatically perfect, but it is what you get. You get what you, you know, you, what the you analysis see is sound. what you get. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, yeah. anyway, not, thanks again, saying, Kenny. It's not going to be a Merrill Lynch, you know, choreographed <laughs> right, piece, of, right. piece of analysis. That it's not going to be. It's not going to be a white paper. <laughs> no, it's not going to be a white okay. paper. Well, thanks again for uh, coming on the show here, Kenny. It was all, uh, a real pleasure having you again. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for calling and uh, and I'll be happy to do it again. And Arusha, did That's I tell it. you I love you, Arusha? I, think <laughs> I love you too, Kenny. Yes. <laughs>
that's going to wrap it up for us today. Thank you so much for joining us. And please join us next week when we're going to have David Lundgren back on the show. He is a portfolio manager over at Motor Capital Management and also a host of a podcast, Build a Gap podcast for the CMT Association. So uh, please join us for that. And thanks a lot for watching today. See ya.